Are you talking about? I'm talking about an example. Example being a guide, a blueprint, a pattern for our lives. Years ago, when I first uh, decided to get into awakening to a fitness journey, this is back several years. You remember the song, Let's Get Physical? You know, okay. We were all invited to go to aerobic classes. I can remember my very first aerobic class. I went in and it was Spandex City. You know, I wasn't quite prepared for everything that was going to unfold for me. I was my first time. I wasn't really certain what the aerobics class was all about. And there they were with their spandex and their leg warmers. And uh, they had their headbands and their wristbands. And I could see that I wasn't prepared. The only thing I brought was a large waistband. <laughs> boom, boom. And uh, so, you know, you get into the class and the music starts and everybody starts jumping and uh, I'm in the front row thinking I'm just really, you know, going to get into this class and the woman behind me says, left, left, go left. I said, I am, it's my other left. You know, I'm just trying to work through it all and then there was right, right and I think, I am right. No, you're so wrong. And she suggested, why don't you go to the back of the row? Of back row of the, the whole class. And she said, here's a little tip. This is not a place for interpretive dance. This is not a place for you to interpret your own gestures. There is a routine you have to follow. So keep your eyes on the instructor and follow. Great advice, isn't it? Great advice we can learn in rugby class and we can also learn in church. And we can also learn from the scripture. Keep your eye on the instructor Follow the routine. Follow the one who is teaching and showing the way. Well, Jesus is our great example. This is one of the powerful things that we see as we look at his advice, which is saying, follow me. In other words, copy me, do as I do. And quite often we get a little confused and we're more caught up in worshiping, celebrating, honoring Jesus rather than following Jesus. Interesting, he never invited us to worship him. He didn't invite his followers to fall at their knees, bow down, and pray to him. He did invite them, though, to follow, to copy, to do as I do. And he set forth us, for us all kinds of examples. All through the scriptures, we find these passages, go and do thou likewise. The invitation there that every Bible story is our story. We can't emphasize that enough. Every Bible character is the unfolding of the characters within us the different decisions and choices we make in the stories. And Jesus, too, is a revelation of you and I as we begin to understand and discover through the examples and ways that he has shown us, taught us, through the beautiful Bible stories about Jesus, we're learning the examples of how to live our life to our highest and best. John chapter 13, 15 shows this. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Wow. Jesus saying this, I'm giving you a pattern. I'm giving you a model. I'm giving you a blueprint. Do just as I have done. We find in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, a blueprint, a model, a pattern that you should follow in his footsteps. John chapter 13, verses 13 through 16, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so am I. If then the Lord and teacher washed your feet, you should also wash another's feet. For I've given you the example that you should do as I did. You see, over and over again, Scripture is inviting us to see Jesus as our great example, not our great exception. And we get so confused in our spiritual journeys as we've set aside Jesus as that great exception. So we read the Bible stories and they're all about honoring Jesus, we think, rather than them explaining to us how to live our daily life. Rather than following, we become people who simply watch or observe. We read the stories. We watch Jesus feeding the 5,000. Oh, that can't be us. We couldn't do that. We watch Jesus healing well, we couldn't do that. We watched Jesus and we became watchers instead of observers and, and participants in the very invitation to copy, to do just as Jesus did. He was this great example for us. And when we understand that, we, under, we understand the role that we're called to live for. He set the pattern. He set the example for us. He was one who realized his sonship. And we too must realize our own sonship. There are many people who say, well, he was the son of God. 
are you not also children of God? Well, we are. So as he discovered his sonship, we discover our sonship. We discover the divinity within us. He set the example of that pathway, a personal discovery to unfold the power of God within him. And we too then are called to copy, to follow those footsteps, to discover the power of God within us. It's beautiful as we find several examples through scripture speaking to us where Jesus gives us the guidelines, the pattern, the blueprint how to live our life. I'd like to reflect on the story from Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus says these famous words, get thee behind me, Satan. We think about it and sometimes we flippantly offer that phrase. Uh, anytime somebody wants to tempt you while you're on a diet, you simply say, get thee behind me, Satan. When there are those who are trying to send, tempt you at the store with some new purchase of an expensive item, when you know you're on a budget, you say, get thee behind me, Satan. We say that always because we're kind of understanding what Jesus was saying is this is an adversarial thought and that's what Satan is. We think of Satan sometimes in Sunday school, maybe created as some sort of being, a red outfit, horns, a little pointed tail, whatever, pitchfork. You know, everybody's got different stories. That this is some sort of devil out to get us as if it is some sort of creature or being. But it is our negative or adversarial thoughts. Let's look to the example Jesus gives us in this passage. Jesus is telling his disciples that I must go to Jerusalem and there I will face those oppressors. I will face those who stand against me. I will go against them. And yes, they may take me and haul me away, persecute me. I may be crucified, but in three days I will raise again. Peter says, absolutely not. I won't stand for it. That's not going to happen. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, was Peter Satan? No, Peter was not Satan. But yet he was referring to Peter, talking to Peter. He just referred earlier in this passage as Peter is the rock. Wait a minute, if you're the rock that we build our foundation on, how are you Satan? You see, it's Peter's adversarial thinking that was going against the very design and plan that, of God that Jesus was unfolding for him in his life. So often we want to think of the material ways that things are going to resolve versus the spiritual ways. And what was happening here is Peter is simply saying, that's not going to happen. That's not the way the story ends. That's not the way the story goes. We're going to stand up. We're going to fight. We're going to do all these kind of things. We, we won't let you, Jesus, be taken away. Oddly enough, he was the first one to be betray. He was the ones who, you know, uh, quit, I mean, wouldn't stand with Jesus. Uh, when the rooster crowed, he uh, denied Yet he's the one now taking this defense, say, in material ways, we will take in the physical ways, we will do this, we will solve the problem. And Jesus says, that kind of thinking is adversarial. It will happen through the spiritual ways. In other words, I will go, yes, take up my cross. I will die, but I will be resurrected because I never die, you never die, none of us die, we're all eternal beings will all eternal life. So the victory will be manifested through the spiritual, not through the material. Here's the beautiful lesson for our lives. So often we are followers of the physical and material ways of blessing in our lives. Rather than allowing the spiritual blessing, the divine way to unfold in our lives that would reveal something powerful and would reveal the very hand and grace of God versus always looking to the physical or to the material way. So Jesus said, when we're thinking in for our highest and best, we release some of these things and attachments to physical material ideas that would only hold us. We think that's the only way. How many of us, well, we struggle with the word how in all of our spiritual life because one of our big questions is, how is this gonna work out? How's the miracle gonna happen? How's God gonna provide? We talk about discovering our abundance, but how? How is all this gonna happen for us? Because we want to know and we want to see it all unfold in physical, material ways, don't we? And this is a beautiful example. That's the adversarial thinking that works against the spiritual. The spiritual says, leave the how up to God. All you need to do is trust. And as we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not unto our own understanding, we know that God will direct our paths. 
So this is where the adversarial thought, that sort of uh, Satan, that sort of consciousness and thinking that Peter was presenting was saying, we're going to work it out in the physical ways. We're going to figure out how we're going to do all this. Jesus said, allow, allow the spiritual to happen. You get behind me with this kind of thinking. I don't want to be part of it. Get behind me because I don't want it in forefront. I don't want that kind of thinking leading my pathway. I don't want to think constantly in ways of the material and physical. I want to think constantly in the ways of the spiritual and knowing that I don't need to know on the how. I just simply trust and the divine pattern will unfold for me. How beautiful it is when we understand that we put this adversarial kind of thinking behind us. Jesus was the great example in this and inviting you too to say, let's let go of this adversarial thinking that says, I always got to know the how. I always got to figure it out. And my own means and my own way. You know what that is? That's called working hard. And working easy is simply allowing the Spirit of God to provide for us, to make the way clear. As we step forward, we know that God is unfolding for us as we trust. God is making the way as we trust. God is providing for us as we we trust. So what we see here is this adversarial thinking, which we call the stinking thinking. That's a good way to remember it. Satan is really stinking thinking, thinking that's working against the whole spiritual growth and development that you're called to live that Jesus set for us as an example. What happens when we get into stinking thinking? It's negative thoughts. It calls us and drags us down into drama. And that drama creates and plays out like a triangle. Do we have a slide of that? Okay, screens are down, all right. Then let me explain it to you. I'll give you the visual. (laughs) The drama triangle is this, that you've got the victim and you've got the perpetrator and then you've got the rescuer. You see this little triangle going here? And quite often when we get into drama, we feel, oh, wait a minute, someone's persecuting me and I feel like I'm a victim. And I've got to run to someone to be the rescuer. And we're so, what we're triangulizing in triangulation, we're creating this sort of drama. Rather than dealing with it directly, what we do is we go off to someone else to be the rescuer. Rather than taking responsibility and in direct dealing it is when you have a challenge with someone, what do you do? You get on the phone and call six others. Oh, oh, wait, no, that's that's not right. That's not what we do at all, is it? What we're called to do is when you have a problem with someone, you go to that problem and you directly work through that problem and you take responsibility for that problem. Oh, but we like the drama triangle. Instead, we're looking for someone to rescue. Stephanie, you don't know about the problem I have with John. And I know you can work it out, even though you're not involved. You've never been there. You weren't part of it, everything else. I'm looking to you because, of course, you'll side with me. And that's why I'm looking for you to rescue. And so we come into this drama triangle that we recreate in our own lives rather than taking responsibility and saying, wait a minute, if I had a challenge with John, I need to work that out. And I have to think, is the challenge about John or is the challenge about me and how I think of John? And how do I take responsibility for this so that I'm not caught up in the drama? But you see, this drama triangle sometimes plays out in our views of our spirituality and our religion because we then too feel like we have us or you as the person, then you've got Satan, and then we have God the rescuer. And we're always thinking we've got to run and we've been taught, go to God, take it to God, all this kind of stuff. When God is saying, I am within you, I am working in you, you don't have to go outside of me, go somewhere else, take responsibility and direct deal within. Interesting, isn't it? Because we play out this triangulation in our day-to-day life with drama all the world around us. We try to create that drama and, and divide the world. And so we do sometimes in our spirituality. We, we say, I got to run to something outside. I got to run to a God out there. He's going to rescue me. Wait till I tell God what John has done. Mm-hmm. And he'll straighten everything out. Wait till I rat on him because God maybe doesn't even know how bad John has treated me. And John hasn't. I'm using it as a wonderful example. My point is this, we get in these triangles where Jesus said, wait a minute, Satan, get behind me. Evil stinking thinking, get behind me. I take responsibility. You know what said? Jesus didn't say, oh God, did you just hear what Peter said? 
Jesus doesn't say, Lord, I need to come to you and tell you, Peter is trying to make my life miserable. He's trying to get me to think that I could work out these means through the material and physical ways. He's trying to detract me from thinking spiritual ways of God blessing me. And so I got to rat on Peter to God. I got to go to him as my rescuer. When God is saying all along, the divine power is within you. I can do all things through Christ is what it says. I can do it because why the power is within me. When I awaken to that power within me, I t it is me taking responsibility. Jesus took responsibility and made things very clear and said very decisively, get behind me. I don't want any part of this. How about we all do the same in our lives? When drama wants to creep in and wants to sneak into our lives, we just say, I take responsibility. I'm going to speak out. Get behind me. I don't need to run to anyone or anything for the divine power of God is within me and I take responsibility to speak. It's gone. Interesting thing that we find here is that as we uh, take personal responsibility, we are becoming and following the very example of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the bread. I am the life. I am the light. He owned it and he proclaimed what he was and who he was. And what is the I am? Well, the I am is God's name revealed within us. I am, and that's what we declare. So I am responsible. I am filled with the power of God. I am moving in grace and uh, forgiveness. I am all these things. We are now claiming that which is dwelling within us. We need not be caught up in a drama triangle in any ways in our lives. For Jesus set us this very example to, as we express this, we understand that uh, we don't need to run to anything else, or run to anyone else but work within us. So here's the thing. What we want to understand is to follow Jesus' example, we must get some clarity about some spiritual things for our lives that are just plain practical. How about it? Everybody believe that spirituality is practical? But sometimes we think, oh, it's so mystical. Oh, it's something out there. But we realize that all of spirituality is guiding you to your highest and best. It's helping you to understand how to live your life to the very best that you can. So let me just follow some of Jesus' examples that he's laid out for us that are very key. One is, I want you to know that we create our challenges and we have the power to uncreate or shall we say recreate them? We create every one of our own challenges in our life. It's there in our life because we caused it. So if it's there when we caused it, we can change it. We can change it. How powerful that is. When we realize every circumstance, everything that you're in, you created it. And you have the power then to uncreate, shall we say, or recreate or go in a new direction. For what did Jesus say? You must be born again. You must recreate. You must undo what you've done before and start all over. You must have a new thought. You must embrace a new way of thinking. You must make a change. It's you. It's no one else. Now, a lot of times we think, God doesn't make us born again. God doesn't say, Stephanie, today you will be born again. I'm forcing you to be born again. You don't have a choice to be born again. That's not at all. What happens is we choose. The invitation is you choose. You take responsibility. You decide, I'm going to make a change. If I don't like what I've created, I'm going to recreate it. If I don't like where I'm headed, I'm going to make a change. If I don't like what's happening in my world, well, I have the power, the divine power to be born again, to start all over, to make something different for life is full of all kinds of choices. And you can change any of the circumstances within your life. What Jesus did, and we're following his example, he said, copy me. Jesus was in the midst of drama at the wedding of Cana. Can you imagine? What? We have no wine. The celebration is going on and there's no wine. What are we going to do? And you can imagine the trauma. You can imagine everybody running to one another and saying, someone forgot to bring wine. You didn't bring enough wine. You didn't care enough wine. Why is there not enough wine here? And going right. Instead, Jesus took charge. And here he turns the water into wine. And saying, I can change the circumstances of the life and the world around me. Beautiful example, so metaphorical for us. 
He can change all kinds of things and circumstances within our life. He could change the sickness into healing and wholeness. He calmed the storms in the midst of the seas. And we have the same. You may think that you're being tossed all around by the chaotic world that you're living in. And you may feel like your ship is being tossed all over. And you know what? You have the power to change that. You have the power to wake up one night, day in the midst of all your drama and chaos and just say, peace. Peace be still. Peace, just be still. And we have that power to follow the example of Jesus within our own lives. Interesting thing is he spoke the change. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Inviting Lazarus to come out of the tomb. He spoke to the man who was ill, be healed. He said, to the one who was lame by the poolside, take up your bed and walk. He spoke to the storm, peace be still. In each case, Jesus speaks. And you're invited to do the same to speak the change. How about it? You wake up in the morning and you speak the change. You say, yesterday was this kind of day, but today I speak the change that today is this kind of day. I was headed this way, but today I experienced this born again, starting all over moment that says, I speak the change and I follow the example of Jesus that no matter what was there, I speak with the authority that my life is going in a new direction. I am going in a new direction. I am living that way. We sometimes are denying the power within us when we run to something outside of us. We're looking for that rescuer. We're looking for God somewhere outside of us when all we do is turn to the divine power within us and speak the change, speak the transformation. Because our great error and all sin is, is simply an error. You make a mistake. The word sin just simply means hamartia, means missing the mark. You made a mistake. So error, the error is that when we constantly look for something outside of us, we're missing the power of the divinity within us. And that's our great error. That's our great sin. We're missing out on the fact that God dwells within and we take responsibility and we speak the change that we so desire within our lives. Secondly, I want you to understand Jesus set the example for us that you're the master creator of your physical experience. You created this life. You created and you now have the opportunity to be the change that you want to see. So I find all these people who come to me and say, Pastor, you'll never believe... I'm never going to get a job. I'm never going to get a job. Well, that's true. You will never get a job because you're creating that kind of reality in your consciousness. And so you do nothing about it. And you give up and you quit. A young man came to me and says, I'll never have a boyfriend. Oh, I'll never have a boyfriend. I'll never. I said, you are absolutely right. And he never did have a boyfriend because he kept professing and kept creating his reality. Here we find Jesus spoke in a new reality. He spoke proclaiming new and new directions, new power, new presence, new changes uh, that he brought about in the world. The third thing I want to talk to you about is this, that as we are followers of Jesus and we're going to copy him as followers, nothing is real and it's only real if you make it real. Because this is the whole thing. We give power to things that are actually powerless. And in the fields of drama, Quite often we give power to the drama and we stir the chaos and we give power to it when we could actually find that it is powerless and would fade away and go away when we take responsibility and when we speak in a way that says, I'll have no part of it. So one of the things that's really important is that we make sure that we're not making something real that isn't real to begin with because nothing is real unless you're going to make it real. King Saul in the Bible looked at David with such jealousy as if David was constantly going to try to take away his throne. That jealousy created an activity within him that he was always an adversary with David and that was not David's intention at all. But Saul made it real. He created that in his mind. He welcomed that and he lived out that. And King Saul and David were always at odds when yet at the same time they had very same uh, outlook, passions, desires for the nation of Israel to succeed. 
Our illness sometimes is only real when we want to make it real because in the divine power of God, what is real is God's intention that you are completely whole. You are perfect. God never has intended for you to be sick. God doesn't want you to be sick. God doesn't make you sick. The divine power of God is all good. It doesn't bring upon something upon you to make you sick. But instead what happens is quite often we embrace it and we begin to make it real. We become sicker the more we think about our sickness, the more we claim these things. So the key is to choose. We have the power to choose every day. Jesus set that example by the choices he made in saying, get thee behind me. I make a choice. I take responsibility right now. Peter, you may have some stinking thinking, but I rebuke that stinking thinking and I make a choice to think differently. Number four I want to bring out is no one or nor anyone is against you. Now, wait a minute. People say, wait a minute. There's people at work who want to make my life miserable. There's people around the world who are constantly trying to make things difficult for me. No one is against you unless you are welcoming them in the spirit of being against you. Because you have the power to see that no one in the world is your enemy. No one in the world is your enemy. Jesus invites us to pray for our enemies. Jesus invites us to do this spiritual work every single day that we begin to release any kind of wall and barrier that we would have between any individual in our world. So when we have this consciousness to say, I pray for my enemy, I pray for that one that I felt like they were an adversary or working against me. And now I am at this wonderful place that I am not allowing them to be an enemy. So no one is against me. They're for me. And when I live in that attitude, I find like I break down all kinds of barriers and walls. Whenever we live from a loving perspective where we're always demonstrating, I believe that nothing's against me. I just always, everything's for me. And I walk out with that kind of spiritual attitude. I realize that there are no enemies out there. It's kind of like a naivete, shall we say. That simplicity you have as a child that you believe all things are good. All things will be fine. Everything will work out great. Everything is, you see, nothing is against you. Nothing is working to bring harm to you. Until all of a sudden we are taught this idea that, oh, someone's out to get you. There's always uh, someone who's going to make your life miserable. There's always something that's going to working against you in some way. And we begin to embrace that more and more and it becomes into our consciousness. And then we begin to think that everyone in the world is against us. And we begin to think everything is working for us, uh, not working for us. So what are we creating today as we follow the example of Jesus? What I want to bring about is this beautiful passage, Ephesians 3.20. With God's power working in us, God can do so much, much more than anything that we could ask or imagine. God's power working in us. It's in us. It's working through us. It's working around us. It's always working for us. When we understand those principles at work, we understand everything that Jesus wanted to teach us and demonstrate for us. So what we want to learn today is that as we follow Jesus, we copy Jesus. He set the pattern for us of how to respond to life's crisis what to do when drama comes our way, how to work things through. We take responsibility. We take the ownership and say, I speak now that I am free. I am not burdened. I am not wounded. I am not the victim. I am the victor. And I celebrate this. And I celebrate that no harm is coming to me, that no one is against me. And whatever circumstances are out there in my world, I may have created but I can uncreate or recreate. I have the power to bring change. Jesus set that example. Are you ready today to be a change maker? Are you ready to copy Jesus? Amen.